Chapter Twenty One of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One. The player's account of himself had interested me more than he knew, especially that part of it which referred to the unfortunate Count de Bagnols. There seemed something extraordinary in the chance which, through circumstance after circumstance of his history, upon my knowledge and I felt a superstitious sort of feeling about it, which was weak, I own, but which was pardonable, perhaps, in a mind labouring like mine under a high degree of morbid excitement. I fancied that I was destined to be the Count's avenger, and I felt, at the same time, that I should be doing human nature good service in ridding the world of such a man as the Marquis de Saint-Brie. Nor did I believe that the eye of heaven could look frowningly upon so signal an act of justice i reasoned finally too upon the right of an individual to execute that retributive punishment which either the laws of his country were inadequate to perform or its judges unwilling to enforce but where was there ever yet a deed unsusceptible of fine reasoning to justify it to the doer acts well nigh as black as the revolt of satan have met able defenders in their day and in the prejudiced tribunal of my own bosom i easily found a voice to sanction what i had already determined in regard to the papers of the count de bagnols which had fallen into my possession by so curious a train of circumstances i had them still about me but i did not think fit to mention the circumstance to monsieur achilles lefranc upon whose judgment i had no great reason to rely i determined however if fortune should ever permit me to revisit my own country to seek out the nearest relations of the count and to deliver the papers into their hands as an act of justice to the memory of that unhappy nobleman and i also felt a sort of stern pleasure in the hope of once more measuring my sword with the daring villain whose many detestable actions seemed to call loudly for chastisement there might be a touch of over-excited enthusiasm of that sort of exaltation of mind which men call fanaticism in religion and which borders upon frenzy when it relates to the common affairs of life but i hope i believe nay i am sure that there was no thirst of personal revenge in that wish i felt indignant that such a man should have been allowed to live so long and that neither private vengeance nor public justice should yet have overtaken him with the fate he so well merited and my sensations which were at all times irritable enough had been worked up by the scenes and circumstances i had lately gone through to a pitch of excitement which not every man could feel and none perhaps can describe while little achilles had been engaged in recounting his history he had kept close by my side jogging on upon his ass looking like a less corpulent and more youthful sancho panza accompanying a less gaunt and grimly quixote not that i believe my appearance had been much improved by two such nights as i had passed nor indeed was the bandage around my head very ornamental and in this respect was I but the better qualified to represent the doughty hero of La Mancha. No adventures, however, of any kind attended our journey, and we passed the mountains and descended into Spain undisturbed. Towards three o'clock, after having proceeded near ten miles in an eastern direction, we reached a little village, which seemed a great resort of the smugglers for here every one of them was known and several of them had their habitations if indeed such a name could be applied to the spot where they only rested a few brief days in the intervals of their long and frequent absences the moment our cavalcade was seen upon the hill above the village a bustle made itself manifest amongst the inhabitants and we could perceive a boy running from house to house spreading the glad news a crowd of women and children assembled in an instant and coming out to meet us expressed their joy with a thousand gratulatory exclamations the rich golden air of a spring afternoon in spain the picturesque cottages covered with their young vines and scattered amongst the broken masses of the mountain 
the gay dresses of the spanish mountaineers the graceful forms of the women and children and the beautiful groups into which they fell as they advanced to greet us all offered a lovely and interesting sight to the eyes of a stranger it was one of the pictures of claude gelet wakened into life every one sprang to the ground and a thousand welcomes and embraces were exchanged the sight of which made my heart swell with feelings i cannot describe there were none to embrace or welcome me amongst the foremost of those who came to meet us on our arrival was a beautiful young woman of the most delicate form and feature i ever beheld exquisitely lovely in every line but so slight so fragile it seemed as if the very breath of the mountain wind would have torn her like a butterfly she ran on however with a quicker step than all the rest and casting herself into the gigantic arms of garcias gazed up in his face with a look of that tender affection not to be mistaken while a glistening moisture in her eye told how very very glad she was to see him returned in safety she was the last person on earth one would have imagined the wife of the fierce and daring man to whom her fate was united but garcias with her was not fierce it seemed as if to him her tenderness was contagious and the moment his eye met hers its fire sunk and softened and it only seemed to reflect the tender glance of her own after giving a delicious moment or two to the first sweet feelings of his return the smuggler appeared suddenly to remember me and taking me by the hand he presented me to his wife as a french gentleman to whom he and his were indebted for much adding that all the hospitality she could show me would not repay the kindness and patronage he had received from my house she received me with a modesty and a grace and a simple elegance i had hardly expected to meet in an insignificant mountain village and led the way to their dwelling which was by far the best in the place not even excepting that of the principal officer of the spanish customs who somewhat to my surprise came out of his house to welcome back garcias with more friendship than i could have supposed to exist between a smuggler and a douanier our arrival was a signal for feasting and merriment some of the youths of the village had been very successful in the chase and the delicate flesh of the izzard with fine white bread and excellent wine were in such abundance that my poor little follower achilles le pont ate and drank and sang and gesticulated seeming to think himself quite in the land of promise he busied himself about everything and though he neither understood nor spoke one word of the language he was so gay and so lively and so well pleased with himself that he won the good will of the whole village after affording us shelter till we had supped as soon as the sun began to sink behind the mountains every house in the place poured forth its inhabitants upon a little green in the centre stood a group of high ash trees under which the great majority seated themselves notwithstanding the disagreeable odour of the cantharides which were buzzing about thickly amongst the branches the rest took it in turns to dance to the music of a guitar which was played by the young smuggler whose vocal powers i had already been made acquainted with never in court or drawing-room did i see more grace or more beauty than on that village green while the awful masses of the mountain stretching blue and vast behind offered a strange grand contrast to the light figures of the gay ephemeral beings that were sporting like butterflies before me and mingling of the two scenes and the calm placidity which both tended to inspire did not fail to find its way to my heart and to soothe and quiet the anguish which had not yet left it in the meanwhile the musician joined his voice to the notes of his guitar and sang one of their village songs song dance 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 life so quick is past seize ye its minutes for joy as they fly existence flowers so brief a space may last twere pity to see them but blossom and die dance 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 on the roses tread 
that swift fleeting time shall let fall ere he go he's now in his spring but full soon shall he shed on every dark ringlet his wintry snow dance 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 cheat the heavy hours their tyrants would bind us to time's chariot fast weave then a chain of gay summer flowers and make them our slaves while youth's reign shall last he had scarcely ended and was still continuing the air upon his guitar when a horse's feet were heard clattering up over the stones of the village and in a moment or two after a young man rode up dressed in a costume somewhat different from that of the villagers but still decidedly spanish on his appearance the dance instantly stopped several voices crying it is francisco from lerida he brings news of fernandez what news of fernandez together with a variety of other exclamations and interrogatories making a quantum of noise and confusion sufficient to prevent his answering any one distinctly for at least five minutes after his arrival the horseman however seemed but little disposed to reply to any one slowly dismounting from his horse with what appeared to me an air of assumed importance ah he is playing his old tricks cried one of the merry boys of the village he wants to frighten us about fernandez no indeed cried francisco with a sigh i have as the old story-book goes so often cried out wolf that perhaps you will not believe me now when it is true but i bring you all sad news and with a heavy heart i bring it to you my cousin especially he continued speaking to garcias's wife who sat beside her husband with her elbow leaning on his knee i know not well how to tell you what i have got to relate but i came off in speed this morning to see what we could all do to mend a bad business your brother fernandez is now in prison at lerida and i am afraid that worse may come of it in prison why how what for exclaimed garcia starting up he shall not be in prison long i fear me he will replied the other shaking his head i fear me he will if ever he come out of it you all know the dreadful state of our province of catalonia since that tyrant villain the count duke has filled it with the most lawless and undisciplined soldiers in spain for the last three months our minds have been worked up to a pitch of desperation which every day threatened to plunge us into anarchy and revolt wrong upon wrong exaction after exaction oppression outdoing oppression but fernandez what of him cried garcias speak of him francisco we well know what you have endured well then all i can tell you of him is this proceeded the catalonian apparently not well pleased at having been interrupted in the fine oration he was making as far as i could hear for i was not present he interfered to prevent one of the base soldados from maltreating a woman in the street the soldier struck him fernandez is not a man to bear a blow and he plunged his knife some six inches into his body he was immediately arrested disarmed and carried to the castle if the soldier dies he will they say be shot off from one of the cannon's mouths if he recovers the galleys are to be fernandez's doom for life the wife of the smuggler had listened to this account of her brother's situation without proffering a word either of inquiry or remark but i saw her cheek like a withering rose growing paler and paler as the incautious narrator proceeded till at length as he mentioned the horrible fate likely to befall the hero of his tale she fell back upon the turf totally insensible the effect of the history had been different upon garcias his brow became bent as the speaker went on it is true but the passionate agitation which at first seemed to affect him wore away and he assumed a cold sort of calmness which remained uninterrupted even upon the fainting of his wife he raised her in his arms however and bidding francisco wait a moment till he could return he carried her away towards their own dwelling accompanied by all the women of the place in whose care he left her 
on coming back he questioned the catalonian keenly to ascertain whether his brother-in-law had been in any degree to blame but from all the replies he could obtain it appeared that the conduct of the soldier had been gross and outrageous in the extreme that fernandez as they called him had merely interfered when no man but a coward or a panda would have refrained and that he actually stabbed the soldier in defence of his own life garcias made no observation but he held his hand upon the pommel of his sword and every now and then his fingers clasped upon it with a sort of convulsive motion which seemed to indicate that all was not so quiet within as the tranquillity of his countenance bespoke well said he at length looking up to the sky which by this time began to show more than one twinkling star shining like a diamond through the blue expanse well it is too late to-night to think of what can be done come francisco you want both food and rest come you must lodge with us monsieur de l'orme he added turning to me and speaking in french you will find our lodging but hard and our fare but poor but if you will take the best of welcomes for seasoning to the one and for down to the other you could not have more of it in a palace i returned home with him to his cottage but not wishing to intrude more than i could help upon his privacy when i knew his wife was both ill in body and in mind and fearful also of interrupting any conversation he might wish to have with his companion i retired to a room which had been prepared for me and undressing myself with the assistance of my little follower achilles who made a most excellent extempore valet de chambre i cast myself on the bed hardly hoping to sleep a long day of fatigue had been friendly to me however in this respect and i scarcely saw my little attendant nestle himself into a high pile of dried rosemary with which the mountains abound and which with the addition of a cloak forms the bed of many a mountaineer before i was myself asleep my slumbers remained unbroken till i was awakened by garcias shaking me by the arm it was still deep night and starting up i saw by the light of a lamp which he carried that he was completely dressed and armed with more precaution than even during his excursions into france i have to ask your pardon monseigneur said he in a low deep tone as soon as i was completely awake for thus disturbing you and indeed it was my intention not to have done so but i am about to set out for lerida and before i go i wish to lay before you such plans as are most feasible for your comfort and safety in spain in the first place you can remain here if a poor village and poor fare and mountain sports may suit you but if you do your time may hang heavy on your hands and beware of lightening it with the smiles of our women remember the spaniard is jealous by nature and revengeful too and there is not a black-eyed girl in this village that has not some one to watch and to protect her the blood rose in my cheek and i replied somewhat hastily were she as unprotected as a wild flower do you think i would take advantage of her friendlessness you do me wrong garcias and by heaven were i so willed it would be no fear of a revengeful spaniard would stand in the way of my pursuit but as i said you do me wrong great wrong be not angry my noble count replied the smuggler with a calm smile i know what youth and idleness may do with many a one even with the best dispositions i warned you for your own good and i am not a man who values any of this earth's empty bubbles so highly as not to say my mind when i am sure that it is right but hear me still humble as i am in station i have one or two friends of a higher class and i can give you a letter to the new corregidor of saragossa who will easily obtain you rank in the spanish armies if you choose to employ yourself in war which i know is the only occupation that you nobles of france can hold not to saragossa replied i no not to saragossa i cannot go there but you say the new corregidor what has become of the former one he died last month replied garcias and a good man he was god rest his soul he was much beloved by all classes of the people he died they say of grief for the loss of his only child but if you love not saragossa hark to another plan i go to lerida you can accompany me as far as the town gates 
but you must not go with me farther you have heard of the fate of my wife's brother he must he shall be saved or i will light such a flame in catalonia as shall burn up these mercenary sworders by whom it is consumed as by a flight of devastating locusts ay shall burn them up like stubble what may come of my journey i know not death perhaps to many and therefore though you may go with me to lerida turn off before you enter the town and make all speed to barcelona where you will find many a vessel ready to sail for france you will easily find your way to paris where you must conceal yourself as well as if you were in spain and as you will land in a different part of the country from that where your appearance might prove dangerous to yourself you will run no risk of interruption in your journey at the same time you will be able more easily to communicate with your family and friends and negotiate at the court for your pardon i did not hesitate in regard to which i should choose of the three plans that garcias propounded at once and without difficulty i fixed upon that course which by carrying me directly to paris would give me a thousand facilities that i could not possess in spain though so far from the capital of course a frequent communication existed between my native province and paris and i thus hoped soon to satisfy myself in regard to all the circumstances which had followed my flight from the chateau de l'orme i should also be in the immediate neighbourhood of the count de soissons and i doubted not that by putting myself under his protection i could easily obtain those letters of grace which would ensure me from all the painful circumstances of a trial for murder for although the severities which the cardinal de richelieu had exercised upon the nobles in every case where they laid themselves open to the blow of the law showed evidently that my nobility would be no protection yet knowing little of the politics of the court i fancied that he would not reject the intercession of a prince of the blood royal there is no reason why i should not acknowledge that in these respects i was most anxious about that life which i would have cast into the most hazardous circumstances i even thrown away in an honourable manner but to die the death of a common felon or even to be arraigned as one was what i could not bear to dream of there is something naturally more valuable to man than life itself something more fearful than death for though my whole mind was bent on saving myself from the fate that menaced me at the same time with every thought came the remembrance that it was helen's brother i had slain that she could never never be mine and i cursed the life i struggled for as soon as my determination was expressed garcias pressed me to hasten my movements and as the little player had awoke and seeing me about to depart insisted on accompanying me the next consideration became how to mount him so as to enable him to keep up with the quick pace at which we proposed to proceed horses however were plentiful in the village and the smuggler although it was now midnight took upon himself to appropriate the beast of one of his companions for which i left three gold pieces as payment i was soon dressed and garcias having supplied me with some articles of apparel of which i stood in some need we proceeded to the green where we found francisco who had brought the news of his kinsman's arrest together with the horses and four or five of garcias associates armed like himself and prepared to mount we were instantly in our saddles and set off at all speed greatly to the annoyance of poor little achilles who not much accustomed to equestrian exercise and perched upon the ridge of a tall strong horse looked as if he was riding the pyrenees and riding them ill i kept him close to myself however and contrived to maintain him in his seat till such time as he had in some degree got shaken into the saddle after which he began to feel himself more at his ease and to play the good horseman little conversation took place on the road the mind of garcias labouring evidently under a high degree of excitement which he was afraid might break forth if he spoke and i myself being far too much swallowed up in the selfishness of painful thoughts to care much about the schemes or wishes of others i gathered however from the occasional questions which garcias addressed to francisco and the replies he received 
that the whole of catalonia was ripe for revolt that the sufferings of the people and the outrages of the castilian soldiery had arrived at a point no longer to be endured and that the murmurs and inflammatory placards which had lately been much spoken of were but the roarings of the volcano before an eruption several private meetings of the citizens and the peasantry had been held francisco observed and at more than one of these aid arms ammunition money and cooperation had been promised on the part of france all was ready for revolt the pile was already laid whereon to sacrifice to the god of liberty and it wanted but some hand to apply the torch that hand shall be mine muttered garcias that hand shall be mine if they change not their doings mightily and here the conversation again dropped for three hours we rode on in darkness by rough and narrow paths which probably we might not have passed so safely had it been day for we went on with that sort of fearlessness which is almost always sure to conduct one securely through the midst of danger although i felt my horse make many a slip and many a flounder as we went along i knew not the real state of the roads over which we passed till i found him plunge up to his shoulders in a pit of water that lay in the midst by spurring him on however i forced him up the other side and shortly after the day broke showing what might indeed be called the courtesy of a road but which seemed in truth but an old watercourse obstructed with large stones and deep holes and in short a thousand degrees worse in every respect than any path we had followed through the gorges of the pyrenees no feeling i believe is more consistently inconsistent than cowardice children shut their eyes in the dark to avoid seeing ghosts and as long as my little companion achilles could not exactly discover the dangers of the path he proceeded very boldly but no sooner did he perceive by the light of the dawn the holes the rocks and the channels which obstructed the road at every step than he fell into the most ludicrous trepidation and called down upon his head many an objurgation from garcias for hanging behind in the worst parts floundering like a fish left in the shallows during the whole of our journey hitherto we had passed neither house nor village as far as i could discover and we still went on for about an hour before we came even to a solitary cottage where garcias drew in his rein to allow our horses a little refreshment here he paced up and down before the door seemingly anxious and impatient to proceed knitting his brows and gnawing his lip with an air of deep and bitter meditation i interrupted his musings nevertheless to inquire whether he could convey a few lines to their destination which i had written to inform my father that i was at least in safety to be sure replied he hastily taking the letter out of my hand did i not deliver the packet safely to mademoiselle arnault at the chateau and doubt not i will deliver yours too if i be alive and if i be dead he added with a smile i will send it what packet did you deliver to mademoiselle arnault demanded i somewhat surprised i never heard of any packet nay i know not what it contained answered the smuggler it was brought to me by a friend at Hakka, and i know nothing farther than that i delivered it truly that is all i have to do with it and fully as much as any one else has i turned upon my heel again feeling the proud blood of the ancient noble rising angrily at the careless tone with which a peasant presumed to treat my inquiries but the overpowering passions which under the calm exterior of the spaniard were working silently but tremendously like an earthquake preceded by a heavy calm levelled in his eyes all the unsubstantial distinctions of rank nor did i though struck by a breach of habitual respect give above a thought to the manner of his speech the matter of it soon occupied my whole mind and for the rest of the journey i was as full of musing as the smuggler himself a packet from spain for helen arnault what could it mean she who had no friends no acquaintances beyond the circle of our own hall a new flame was added to the fires already kindled in my bosom i suppose that my mind was weakened by all that i had lately suffered for i cannot otherwise account for the wild vague 
jealous suspicions that took possession of me but so it was i was jealous at other times my character was anything but suspicious but now i pondered over the circumstance which had just reached my knowledge viewed it in a thousand different lights regarded it in every aspect and still the jaundiced medium of my own mind communicated to helen's conduct a hue that however extraordinary it did not deserve with thoughts thus occupied i scarcely perceived the length of the way till as we climbed a slight eminence garcias pulled in his rein and looking forward i perceived at no great distance a group of towers and steeples announcing lerida End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of de long by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two the irritable suspicions which without his own knowledge he had excited in my bosom made me still regard the careless manner in which garcias had treated my inquiries concerning the packet he had conveyed to helen as a matter of some offence i forgot that he knew not my feelings on this subject and i am afraid i made no allowance for his excited and overwrought as they were notwithstanding the degree of irritation that i felt however i could not resist the frankness of manner with which he addressed me when we came within sight of lerida here monsieur le comte said he you had better leave us that path will take you into the high road to barcelona whither if i might advise you would make all possible speed my way is towards those towers where my poor catalina's brother lies in bonds what may come of it i do not know but either this night shall see him once more a free man or my head shall lie lower than it ever yet has done farewell monsieur le comte i doubt not we shall meet again do not forget me till then and ever believe that a warm and grateful heart however rude may dwell in the bosom even of a spanish smuggler and that if this arm or this sword can ever serve you, you may command it. Are you too proud to accept that horse you ride as a present from one who is under many a debt of gratitude to your house? I hardly know what it was, for there was certainly very little in his words to change the angry feelings with which I had regarded him a moment before. But the manner wherewith a thing is said more than the thing itself has often the power to let us into the dark council chamber of a man's bosom and show us the motives which govern his actions gleaming through the very coldness of garcias's demeanour i saw the wish to act towards me in the kindest and most grateful manner only overpowered by the excitement of his own circumstances and i instantly made those allowances which i should have done at first i will accept it garcias with pleasure replied i because i hope hereafter to repay it with other debts to you in a way that i have not now the means of doing a word or two more passed and then bidding him adieu i rode along the path he pointed out followed by achilles le Fon, and soon reached the high road of which he had spoken here my poor little companion who had hitherto smothered the torments of st bartholomew rather than risk being left behind found it impossible to contain his expostulations any further monseigneur said he in a tone which mingled the doleful and the theatrical in a very ludicrous degree god knows that i am willing to follow on your steps to the last grain of my sand to serve you with my best service to my last breath but indeed indeed it must be on foot horseback becomes me not i am already worn to the bone so help me heaven as i would rather ride a grindstone by the hour together than the stiff ridge of this hard-backed charger consider my lord consider that my business has ever been on foot and that never but once before did i venture to cast my legs across that iron-spined beast called a horse at least in pity give me half an hour's repose at the first cottage we pass for i can get no farther the request of the poor little man was but reasonable and after proceeding about half a league farther on our way we stopped at a small sort of inn 
where I suppose the carriers from Lerida ordinarily paused to water their horses. Here, with rest and food and wine, I strove to put Achilles into a fit state for proceeding on his journey. But none of these applications seemed to touch the part affected, and the ludicrous stiffness that supervened when he had sat still for a few minutes almost made me abandon the hope of going forward that day. After about an hour, however, a very powerful incentive to motion came in aid of my wishes, and soon induced Monsieur Achilles to start from his settle, and though every joint seemed made of wood and creaked in the moving, he nevertheless got to his horse even more quickly than myself. The cause of this revolution in his feelings was very simple, and consisted in nothing more than a sound somewhat disagreeable to one of his peculiar temperament. The morning was clear and the wind high, coming in quick gusts from the side of Lerida, which, as near as I could judge, lay at a distance of two miles. It was not far enough, however, to prevent our hearing, after having rested, as I said, near an hour, the beating of a drum mingled with the retreat call upon the trumpet. At this Achilles pricked up his ears, and the good dame of the house shrugged up her shoulders, saying, "'The soldiers again! They will never stop till they have taken our oar. A pause then ensued, and a moment after an irregular fire of musketry made itself heard, and close again upon that, burst after burst, came the roaring of some heavy pieces of cannon. The good hostess, who was alone in the house, threw herself upon her knees before a picture of St. Diego, and beseeched him so heartily for protection that I could hardly divert her attention to receive payment for what ourselves and the horses had consumed. In the meanwhile, Achilles, who seemed heartily to sympathise with the hostess, though his feelings urged him in another direction, had moved to his horse with a very white face, and before I could mount was already on the road. "'Let us make haste!' cried he. "'In God's name! To my ears the noise of cannon is no way harmonious. Let us make haste, Monseigneur. I am sure I hear them coming. I do not even love the sound of a firelock. The only drum that should be tolerated is that of a charlatan. And though he may kill as many people or more than a soldier, he does it quietly, promising to cure them all the while. Don't you hear a noise behind us, Monseigneur? I am sure I hear a drum, of which sound the drum of my ears has all the jealousy of a rival. Morbleu! What a roar of cannon! That must have killed a great many people! Such broken exclamations did he continue to pour forth from time to time, as fast as the jolts of his horse admitted, till we had placed a good many miles between us and Lerida. We were then obliged to slacken our pace, though we still heard occasionally the distant roaring of the cannon, proving incontestably that the struggle between the populace and the soldiery continued unabated. Though from very different motives, I was as glad to avoid taking any part in the transactions which, I had reason to believe, were going on at Lerida, as little Achilles himself. I had gathered from the conversation of Francisco and Garcias that the Catalonian peasantry had been instigated to revolt, in no slight degree, by secret agents of the French government, and I had but little inclination to be identified with schemes which I could not look upon as highly honourable. To have been mistaken for one of these agents by the populace would have placed me in a very embarrassing situation, unacquainted as I was with the designs and measures of my own government, and I well knew that to disclaim a character with which the multitude chose to invest one was the surest way to provoke without convincing them. I was therefore anxious on every account to reach Barcelona as speedily as possible, and to quit a country where no pleasing part was left me to play, before the first news of the insurrection caused an embargo to be laid upon the ports. But, unfortunately, our horses had by this time become so jaded that I was obliged to slacken my pace and proceed more slowly, lest they should fail us altogether. About an hour more elapsed before we reached any place that could give shelter and rest for our horses, for I remarked here, as in the country near Saragossa, though Catalonia is better peopled than many parts of Spain, that the towns and villages are sadly distant from one another, 
when compared with the overflowing population of France. At length, however, the road wound up the side of a gentle hill, upon whose green and velvet top a group of old rough cork trees, scarcely yet bearing a blush of tardy verdure upon their branches, were mingled with a number of earlier trees, all clothed in the thousand bright hues of spring. Amongst these, as we rode up, we could every now and then discern the straight lines of a cottage, diversifying the wild and irregular masses of the foliage, and offering here and there a hard outline, cutting upon the clear background of the sky. Yet the whole was the more picturesque and beautiful for those very stiff lines of the buildings, whether from the contrast of the forms alone, or from the mingled associations called up in the mind by the sight of man's habitations, combined with the more graceful productions of simple nature, or from both, I know not. However, there was an air of calm tranquillity in that little village, and its group of trees raised up upon the soft green hill, and standing clear and defined in the pure sunshiny sky, which formed a strange mild contrast with the distant roar that the wind bore in sullen gusts from Lerida. There was a latent moral in every look of nature's face, which, did man but study it, would prove a great corrector of the heart and when I thought of the carnage and the crime which that far-off roar announced, the peaceful aspect of the scene before me made me shudder at the effect of excited human passions, and I hurried on my way to escape as fast as possible from the tumults which I doubted not were then in action at Lerida. Knowing, as I did, that horses are cheap in this part of the country, I resolved to venture some portion of my remaining money rather than delay my progress to Barcelona. Accordingly, as soon as I perceived the least appearance of hospitable walls, I asked poor Achilles if he could muster strength to continue his journey, representing to him that any delay might probably prevent us from quitting Spain, if it did not induce still more disagreeable consequences. A tear of pain and fatigue actually rose in the weary player's eye, as he abandoned the hope of repose with which the sight of the village had inspired him. But the sound of the cannon and the beating of the drum still rung in his ears, and he professed his willingness to go on, as long as he was able, to do anything, in short, to get out of hearing of such sounds as the wind had borne from Lerida. The village, however, was but a poor one, and on inquiring at the posada, whether we could exchange our horses for two fresh ones, offering at the same time a suitable repayment for the accommodation, I was informed that no horse could be obtained in the place for love or money, except those employed in agriculture, which were not precisely suited to my purpose. Nothing remained then but to stay where we were, to give our horses food and four hours rest, and to take what repose we could ourselves obtain. So nearly balanced had been the wishes of poor little Achilles between fear on the one scale and fatigue in the other, that I do not believe he was at all sorry to hear that a halt was inevitable, and while I acted as the groom and took care that every means was employed to renovate the vigour of our beasts, he cast himself upon a chuckle-bed, and within two minutes was sound asleep. I followed his example as soon as I had provided for the renewal of our journey for though well calculated to bear no ordinary portion of exercise, I was now considerably exhausted, having ridden more than thirty leagues that day, in addition to all that I had undergone before. My sleep, however, was feverish and interrupted, and before the four hours were concluded I was again upon my feet. It was about the hour that the Spaniards generally devote to sleeping, during the great heat of the middle of the day, but on going to seek for my horse, I found the villagers collected in various groups at the different doors, all eagerly talking upon some subject that seemed to excite their feelings to the uttermost. I easily conceived that some news had reached them from Lerida, but judging it best to remain as innocent of all knowledge concerning any tumults that might have occurred as possible, I asked no questions, but proceeded towards the stable for the purpose of preparing for our departure leaving my weary follower to enjoy his slumbers till the last moment. Before I reached the door, however, a clattering of horses' hoofs made me turn my head, and I saw a Castilian trooper galloping as fast as his horse would bear him into the village. 
he was armed with a steel headpiece cuirass and gauntlets and mounted on a horse which though wounded and bloody still bore him on stoutly his offensive arms consisted of his long heavy sword a case of large pistols a dagger and two musketoons so that considering him as an opponent his aspect would have been somewhat formidable as he came up he glanced his eye ferociously over the various groups of peasantry amongst whom two or three muskets were visible but without taking farther notice of any one he cut in between me and the stable door and springing to the ground in a moment led out the horse which had borne my little follower thither evidently with the purpose of transferring his heavy demi peak saddle from his own wounded charger to its back this however did not at all suit my purposes and laying my hand upon the halter i told him the horse was mine and that he must stand off this information brought upon my head a torrent of castilian abuse and thrusting himself in between me and the horse he struggled to make me quit my hold raising his gauntleted hand as if to strike me in the face he was a smaller man than myself in every respect and also embarrassed with the weight of his arms so that it was with ease i caught his wrist with one hand to prevent his striking me while with the other i grasped the lower rim of his cuirass and threw him back clanking upon the pavement in an instant half a dozen young villagers sprang out of their houses surrounded the prostrated trooper before he could make any attempt to rise and would i believe have dispatched him with their long knives had i not interfered to save his life viva la francia viva la francia cried half a dozen voices at once let him rise let him rise the french caballero commands it let him rise let him rise some of the catalonians however were for opposing this piece of clemency and evidently animated by the same spirit of hatred to the soldiery as their countrymen of lerida cried aloud to kill the tiger how many of ours has he killed exclaimed they how often has he plundered our houses assaulted ourselves insulted our women let him die let him die but the discussion had for a moment diverted their attention from their prisoner and though one of the strongest villagers had his foot upon the soldier's corslet he contrived suddenly to throw him off and springing up to catch his wounded horse which still stood nigh half a dozen blows with musket stocks and knives were now aimed at him in an instant but leaping into the saddle he spurred his horse through the crowd and saved by his corslet and morion from many a random stroke galloped down the road like lightning at the distance of about a hundred yards however he turned in the saddle and while his horse went on aimed one of his musketoons calmly at the group assembled round me and fired the ball whizzed close by me and grazed the cheek of a villager near leaving a long black wound along that side of his face fortunately for the fugitive none of the muskets were loaded which graced the hands of those he left behind otherwise his flight would have been but short as it was he departed undisturbed and the whole of the group around turned to me inquiring as of one who had some title to command them what was to be done next were they they asked to collect and join the patriots at lerida or to march forward upon barcelona collecting what troops they could on the road and at once attack the tyrants in their headquarters i of course disclaimed not only all right to direct them but all knowledge of the subject telling them that i had merely cast the soldier from me in defence of my own property and that i was not aware what patriots they spoke of at lerida or what tyrants at barcelona what cried one of the young men with a look divided between surprise and incredulity do you not know that the inhabitants of lerida have risen and cast off the yoke of the castilian tyrants do you not know the glorious news that they have beat the mercenary soldados of castile through every street of the city wherever they dared to make a stand till the few that escaped have shut themselves up in the citadel do you pretend not to know that they have well avenged the death of the poor youth that the bloody-minded slaughterers fired off last night from a cannon's mouth Pshaw, you know it well enough and we know too that it was with arms and ammunition from france that all this has been done 
So, viva la Francia, viva el Francais! It was in vain I protested my ignorance of the whole. They were determined to believe me an agent of the French government, and nothing I could say had any effect in persuading them to the contrary. The only means I could devise for extricating myself from the unpleasant situation in which I was placed, without violating the truth, was to tell them that I was going on myself to Barcelona, but that I thought the best thing they could do would be to remain quiet till they heard more particularly from Lerida, taking care to be prepared for whatever event might occur. They received this advice as if it had come from some Delphic oracle. "'Yes, yes, he is right,' cried one. "'We will wait for orders from Lerida.' "'He will get to Barcelona before the Castilian now,' cried the second. "'Quick, saddle the cavalier's horse. "'Send us off a dispatch as soon as all is safe at Barcelona,' cried a third. But to this last I did not think fit to make any reply, as I had not the least intention of complying with the request. All were soon ready to set out, but a sudden difficulty delayed me some time, which was that when about to depart, I could nowhere discover Monsieur Achilles Lacroix, whom I had left upstairs sound asleep. To leave the poor little man alone in a country, the language of which was as unknown to him as Hebrew, was a piece of cruelty I could not think of committing. I was nevertheless nearly obliged to do so, for after looking for him in vain in the room where he had slept, and in every other place I could think of, with the assistance of half a dozen Spaniards, men, women, and children, he was drawn out from below the bed, where he had ensconced himself on hearing the sound of a musket, with the various shouts of the Spaniards in the street. He seemed, however, in no degree ashamed of his cowardice. "'I own it! I own it!' cried he. "'I have nothing of Achilles about me but the name. I am vulnerable from top to toe, and so great a coward into the bargain, that I think the only wise thing my great namesake ever did was in staying away so long from the fields of Troy, and the most foolish thing in going back again at all.' End of chapter 22。chapter 23 of De Lorme by G. P. R. James。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。chapter 23。the horses of the smugglers were accustomed to hard service。and therefore soon refreshed。so that when we again mounted they wanted but little of the vigour。with which they had at first set out。Still, however, twenty leagues lay between us and Barcelona, and since my unfortunate encounter with the trooper, the necessity became more urgent of arriving there with all speed. Nevertheless, it was in vain that we spurred on as rapidly as we could, even little Achilles exerting himself in proportion to his ideas of the danger. Night fell upon our journey ere it was more than two-thirds finished, and as we could not arrive before the gates were shut, we were obliged to pause and wait for the return of day at a small town about ten miles from Barcelona. Here, however, all was quiet, and I judged from the tranquillity that no news had yet reached this place from Lerida, concluding also that the soldado, whose wounded horse must have been soon exhausted, had not yet passed through. In this case, there was still hope of arriving at the city before the insurrection was known, so that we might embark on board any vessel about to quit the port immediately, or even hire one of the light boats that are continually running across the Gulf of Lyon, between Barcelona and Marseille. The next morning, an hour before daybreak, we were again upon our journey, and arrived at the gates of the city not long after they were opened. A crowd of country people were going in, carrying fruit and milk and other articles of consumption to the town and mingling amongst the horses and mules that bore these supplies, we endeavoured to pass in unnoticed. All proceeded very well for some way, till we passed the guard-house near the inner gate. In fact, we had proceeded a few paces beyond, when suddenly a couple of soldiers rushed out, half a dozen more followed, and I was knocked off my horse by a violent blow on my head, which they chose to bestow upon me with a prospective view to prevent my resisting. As soon as I was on my feet again, the cause of this brutal conduct became evident. 
without question, as my good friend, the trooper from Lerida, was the first person that met my eyes. Ha ha! cried he, coming before me, while the others pinioned my arms behind, and shaking his clenched hand in my face with a grin of unutterable rage. Ha ha! We have thee now, and by the soul of a Castilian, I would pluck thy heart out with my own hands, did not the viceroy wish to examine thee himself. But never fear, before two hours be over, thou too shalt have a flight from a cannon's mouth. My situation was not a very agreeable one, but yet it was not one that impressed me with much fear. Indeed, it was never any circumstances of mere personal danger that much agitated me. Anything that touched me through my affections, or through my imagination, ever had a great and visible effect upon my mind. But to all which came in the simple form of bodily danger, I was, I believe, constitutionally callous. While the soldiers were engaged in pinioning my arms with cords, which they drew so tight as almost to tear my flesh, some of their companions dismounted my trembling little companion, and as his excessive fear and non-resistant qualities were very evident, they did not think it necessary to decorate his wrists with the same sort of strict bracelets which they had adapted to mine, but simply led him along after me in a kind of procession towards the arsenal whither, it seems, the viceroy had removed from his own palace the night before, on the news of the insurrection at Lerida. The way was long, and I believe the brutal Castilians found a sort of pleasure in parading us through the various streets, and showing to the populace a new instance of the height to which the daring authority they assumed might be carried. Their insolence, however, seemed to me, even from the glances of the people as we passed, to be likely to receive a check sooner than they imagined. Not a Catalonian did we approach, but I recognised that flash in his eye which told of a burning and indignant heart within, and though they suffered themselves to be shouldered by the licentious and ill-disciplined soldiers as we went along, it was with a bent brow and clenched teeth which seemed to say, The day of retribution is at hand. As we approached the arsenal, I caught a glimpse of the wide, grand ocean, and there was something in the sight of its vast free waves which seemed to reproach me with the bonds I suffered to rest upon my hands. I believe, involuntarily, I made an effort to burst them asunder, for one of the guard, seeing some movement of my hands, struck me a violent blow with the pommel of his sword, exclaiming, "'What? Trying to escape?' Do so again, and I will send a ball through your brains. I was silent, giving him a glance of contempt, which only excited his laughter, and calling to his companions, he bade them look to the proud Frenchman. Patience was the only remedy, and still maintaining my silence, though I own it cost me no small effort, I suffered them to lead me on, with many a taunt and insult, till we arrived at the port and arsenal. Here I was dragged through two large courts and conducted into a stone hall, where I was subjected for near an hour to the insolent jeering of the soldiery, while the Count de Sainte Coloma, then Viceroy, finished his breakfast. To all they could say, however, I answered nothing, which enraged them more than anything I could have replied. "'Have you cut out his tongue, Hernan?' asked one of the soldiers. "'No,' replied the other. Though he well deserves it, I spared it to speak to the viceroy. Slit it, then, as they do the magpies to make them speak, said a third. Oh, the viceroy will find him a tongue, replied the first. Mind you that sullen boor that would not betray the conspiracy at Tarragona, and how the Count of Molino, who then commanded Altasia, found a way to make him speak. How was that? demanded one of the others. I served in the tenth Leguero then, and was not present. Why, he made us tie him on a table, answered the first, and then fix a nice wet napkin over his face, pricking some holes in it, however, or it would have smothered him altogether, they say. As it was, every breath was like the gasp of a dying man, it was so hard to draw it through the cloth, and one might see his fists clenching with the agony, and his feet drawn up every time we poured a fresh ladle full of water over his face. Every now and then, Don Antonio told him to stretch out his hand, 
when he would confess but he bore it stoutly till the blood began to ooze out of his eyes and ears and then he could not hold to it any longer but stretched out his hand and betrayed the whole story after which the conde was merciful and had him hanged without more ado it was fortunate for poor little achilles who sat beside me that his knowledge of spanish did not extend to the comprehension of a single word that passed or this story would probably have bereft him of the little life he had left terror had already made him as silent as the grave for which quality of silence he had never been very conspicuous before and he sat with his eyes staring and meaningless his mouth half open his feet drawn up under the bench and his hands laid flat upon his knees the very image of folly struck dumb with fright there was something so naturally small and unmeaning in his whole appearance that the soldiers seemed to look upon him altogether as a cipher and in this respect his insignificance for some time stood him in as good stead as the armour of his namesake but at length finding that they could draw nothing from me my companion's look of terror caught the castilian's attention and they were proceeding to exercise their guard-room wit at the expense of poor little achilles when suddenly the noise of drums and trumpets was heard announcing as i found from their observations that the viceroy was retiring from the great hall to his own cabinet in a few minutes a messenger arrived with orders for the officer of the guard to conduct the prisoners to his presence but in the lax state of discipline which seemed to reign amongst the castilian troops in catalonia it was not surprising that no officer could be found i was placed however between two soldiers and with some attention to military form led up the grand staircase towards the cabinet of the viceroy at the door of which i was detained till the messenger had announced my attendance the pause was not long for shortly the door again opened and i was told in a harsh tone to go in which i instantly complied with followed by little achilles while the soldiers and the viceroy's officer remained without the scene which presented itself was very different from that which i had anticipated the room was large and lofty lighted by two high windows commanding a view of the sea and altogether possessing an air of cheerfulness rarely found in the interior of spanish houses the furniture was luxurious even amidst a luxurious nation fine arras and tapestry carpets of the richest figures cushions covered with cloth of gold tables and chairs inlaid with silver and a thousand other rare and curious objects that i now forget met the eye in every direction while on the walls appeared some of the most exquisite paintings that the master hand of velasquez had ever produced it put me strongly in mind of the saloon at the marquis de saint brie's pavilion de chasse but the lords of these two splendid chambers were as opposite at least in appearance as any two men could be seated in an ivory chair somewhat resembling in form the curule chair of the ancient romans appeared a short fat man not unlike the renowned governor of barataria as described by cervantes i mean in his figure the excessive rotundity of which was such that a paunch of sancho himself would have ill borne the comparison his face though full in proportion had no coarseness in it the skin was of a clear pale brown and the features small but rather handsome the eyebrows were high and strongly marked the eyes large and calm and the expression of the countenance on the whole noble and dignified but not powerful it offered lines of talent it is true but few of thought and there was a degree of sleepy listlessness in the whole air of the head which to my mind spoke a luxurious and idle disposition the dress of the viceroy for such was the person before me smacked somewhat of the habits which i mentally attributed to him instead of the stiff frays or raised ruff round the neck still almost universally worn in spain he had adopted the falling collar of lace which left his neck and throat at full liberty his justo corps of yellow silk had doubtless caused the tailor some trouble to fashion it dexterously to the protuberance of his stomach but still many of the points of this were left open showing a shirt of the finest lawn his hat and plume buttoned with a sapphire of immense value lay upon a table before him and as i entered he put it on for an instant 
as representative of the sovereign but immediately after again laid it down and left his head uncovered for the sake of the free air which breathed sweetly in at one of the open windows and fanned him as he leaned back on the cushions of his chair behind the viceroy stood his favourite negro slave splendidly dressed in the oriental costume with a turban of gold muslin on his head and bracelets of gold upon his naked arms he was a tall powerful man and there was something noble and fine in the figure of the black with his upright carriage and the free bearing of every limb that one looked for in vain in the idle listlessness of his lord his distance from the viceroy was but a step so that he could lean over the chair and catch any remark which his lord might choose to address to him in however low a tone it was made and at the same time he kept his hand resting upon the rich hilt of a long dagger which seemed to show that he was there as a sort of guard as well as a servant there being no one else in the room when we entered i advanced a few steps into the room followed as i have said by achilles alone and paused at a small distance from the viceroy on a sign he made me with his hand intimating that i had approached near enough after considering me for a moment or two in silence he addressed me in a sweet musical voice i perceive sir said he notwithstanding the disarray of your dress and the dust and dirt with which you are covered that you are originally a gentleman i am seldom mistaken in such things is it not so in the present instance your excellence is perfectly right replied i and the only reason for my appearing before the viceroy of catalonia in such a deranged state of dress is the brutal conduct of a party of soldiery who seized upon me while travelling peacefully on the high road and brought me here without allowing me even a moment's repose i thought i was right rejoined the viceroy somewhat raising his voice but do you know young sir that your being a gentleman greatly aggravates the crime of which you are guilty the vulgar herd brought up without that high sense of honour which a gentleman receives in his very birth commit not half so great a crime when they lend themselves to base and mean actions as a gentleman does who sullies himself and his class with anything dishonourable and wrong from the mean what can be expected but meanness and consequently the crime remains without aggravation but when the well-born and the well-educated derogate from their station and mingle in base schemes their punishment should be not only that inflicted by society on those that trouble its repose but a separate punishment should be added for the breach of all the honourable ties imposed upon a gentleman for the stigma they cast upon high birth and from the certainty in their case that they fall into error with their eyes open what say you sir i think your excellence is perfectly right replied i the viceroy's observations having given me time to lay down a line of conduct for myself i have always thought so from the time i could reason for myself and such have always been the principles instilled into my mind then what excuse sir have you demanded the viceroy rather surprised at the calmness with which i agreed to all his corollaries what excuse have you for meanly insinuating yourself into another country and by the basest arts stirring up the people to sedition and revolt if i had done so my lord replied i i should be without excuse and the severest punishment you could inflict would not be more than i merited but i deny that i ever did so and more i can prove it impossible that i should have done so from the short space of time which i have been in spain not allowing opportunity for such a crime as has been imputed to me this is the third day i have been in this country the viceroy looked over his shoulder to his slave who stooping forward listened while his lord said in a low tone you were right scipio i am glad i looked to this myself i am afraid i must exert myself or these rude soldados will stir up the people to worse than even that of Lerida. Then, turning to me, he added in a louder voice, I looked upon your guilt, sir, as so evident a matter, that I did not think you would have had the boldness even to deny it. But as you do, it is but just that you hear the charge against you. It is this, that you, a subject of Louis the French King, have, together with many others, found your way into this province of Catalonia, 
and as spies and traitors have instigated the people to revolt against their liege lord and sovereign philip the fourth in evidence of which a castilian trooper of the eleventh tessia deposes to having seen you with the rebels now in arms at lerida and that moreover you overtook him on the road hither and with other rebels at the village of myla would have slain him had it not been for the goodness and speed of his horse what can you reply to this merely that it is false replied i and if your excellence will permit i will tell my tale against his and leave it to your wisdom to find means of judging which is false and which is true proceed proceed said the viceroy throwing himself back in his chair seemingly tired with an exertion that was probably not usual with him and had only been called up by the pressing circumstances of the times circumstances which his own inactivity had suffered to become much more dangerous than he thought them even now proceed sir but do not make your tale a long one for i have many important things to attend to it shall be a very short one my lord i replied my reason for quitting my own country then was that i had slain a man who attempted to strike me a gentleman or a serf demanded the viceroy he was in the classe bourgeoise replied i you did very right said the viceroy go on to escape the immediate consequences i continued i fled across the pyrenees guided by some spanish smugglers who conducted me to a village not far from yaca whence i intended to proceed to barcelona and thence embark for marseilles from marseilles i intended to proceed to paris and there negotiate my pardon so that i might eventually return to my own country in security but said the viceroy what did you at lerida that town lies not in your road from yaca to barcelona my lord i never was at lerida replied i though i have been in spain before i never was within the gates of lerida in my life the viceroy looked over his shoulder to his african confidant saying in the same low tone with which he had formerly addressed him mark his words scipio then turning to me he asked with rather a heedless air then i am to believe young sir that the whole tale of the soldier who accuses you is false and that you and he never met till for the purpose of plundering you or something of the same nature he seized you this morning at the city gates not so my lord i answered far be it from me to say so for i have a heavy charge myself to lay against that soldier he overtook me yesterday on the high road seized upon my attendant's horse and raised his hand to strike me for opposing him good exclaimed the viceroy had you denied meeting him you were undone for he gave last night a full description of your person i now hear you with more confidence explain to me how then you happen to be on the road between barcelona and lerida which is quite as much out of your way from yaca as lerida itself your excellence will remember that i said i was guided by smugglers i replied these smugglers were bound to lerida but they assured me that they would put me in the high road to barcelona after which i could not miss my way they kept their word and i proceeded safely and quietly on my journey till arriving at a village which your excellence calls i think myla i stopped for a few hours to rest my horses here i was overtaken by this soldier who without asking permission or making an excuse seized upon my servant's horse and on my opposing him raised his hand to strike me i threw him back on the pavement and the villagers rushing out of their houses would i believe have murdered him had i not interfered for which good office no sooner was he on horseback than he fired his carbine at my head the ball of which missed me but wounded one of the peasants in the face the viceroy paused for a moment while the african whispered to him over his shoulder in so low a tone that the words did not reach me did you then not hear any report of a revolt at lerida demanded the viceroy at length i did replied i at myla and before that i heard the sound of cannon and musketry from the side of lerida can your attendant speak spanish not a word does he understand it no the viceroy while he spoke looked steadfastly at achilles whose face happily betrayed nothing but the most confirmative stupidity of aspect he then called him forward in french 
and bade him detail what had occurred during the course of the foregoing day the little player had by this time in some degree recovered his intellects and hearing the mild tone in which the viceroy had hitherto questioned me as well as the calmness with which he addressed him himself his penchant for bombas was excited by the solemnity of the occasion and the presence of a representative of royalty and he poured forth a stupendous piece of eloquence such as he thought the ears of a viceroy required may it please your sublime highness said he the following is a true account of what occurred to my noble and estimable lord and to myself during our woeful peregrinations of yesterday and if it is not the exact and simple verity may all the stars of the golden firmament fall upon my head and crush me into atoms the viceroy looked back at the african and laughed but the slave whose oriental imagination was perhaps more in harmony with the tumidity of little achilles's style than the more refined taste of his lord opened his large eyes and seemed to think it very fine indeed neither of them interrupted him however and the player proceeded shortly after aurora had drawn back the curtains of the sun and phoebus himself jumped out of bed and began running up the arch of heaven the illicit dealers who had been hitherto our guides our guards and our sutlers all in one left us to proceed themselves i know not where we were now upon the broad and substantial causeway which leads from the far-famed city of lerida as i am given to understand for i never was there to this renowned metropolis of catalonia when i being much fatigued with the unwanted extension of my legs across the back of my equine quadruped my noble and considerate lord permitted me to stop and repose my weary limbs at a small pot-house by the roadside suddenly after we had been there about an hour loud roared the cannon and quick beat the drum and my lord not loving tumults amongst the people as he said and i not loving tumults amongst the cannon we got upon horseback and rode on till our horses could go no farther truly i was thankful that their weariness came to back my own or verily i believe that my lord whose thighs must be made of cast iron would not have left a bit of skin upon me by riding on till night however we stopped and by the blessing of god i lay down to take what the people of this land call a siesta but what i call a nap when after having lain in the arms of somnus for about half an hour four hours he should have said i was startled by the tremendous sound of a musket and incontinent crept under the bed from whence i was dragged out shortly after by my master mounted on the awful pinnacle of my horse's back and compelled to ride on to another village where we slept in quiet until day this morning after that we proceeded to these hospitable walls where a generous soldier rushed forth upon us and invited us in with a pressing courtesy which was not to be resisted he bestowed upon my lord a long piece of cord which your sublime majesty may observe upon his wrists me he decorated not in the same manner but they took care of both our horses and hold said the viceroy i have heard enough you said continued he turning to me that you had been in spain before where did you then reside and to whom were you known i resided at saragossa replied i and was known to the corregidor and to the chevalier de montenero the conde de montenero said the viceroy good i expect him here this very day or to-morrow at the farthest if he witness in your favour your history needs no other confirmation for though a foreigner all spain knows his honour a foreigner exclaimed i is he not a spaniard certainly not answered the viceroy knew you not that but to speak of yourself mark me young sir you are safe for the present for your story bears the air of truth but woe to you if you have deceived me for you shall die under tortures such as you never dreamed of and to show you that in such things i will no longer be trifled with between these cut-throat soldiers and the factious peasantry i will instantly order your accuser to have the strapado till his back be flayed by the mother of heaven i will no longer have my repose troubled at every hour with the rapacity of these base soldados and the turbulence of the still baser serfs and the full countenance of the count took on an air of stern determination 
which I had not before imagined that it could assume. Scipio, continued he to the negro, see that these two be placed in security where they may be well treated but cannot escape. Bid my secretary, when he arrives from the palace, take both their names in writing and note down their separate stories from their own mouths. Henceforth I will investigate each case to the most minute particular, and, be it peasant or be it soldier that commits a crime, he shall find that I can be a Draco and write my lords in blood. His resolution, unfortunately, came somewhat too late, for his indolence and inactivity had permitted the growth of a spirit that no measures could now quell. The hatred between the soldiery and the people had been nourished by the incessant outrages which the former had been suffered to commit under the lax government of the Count de Saint Coloma and now that the populace had drawn the sword to avenge themselves they were not likely to sheathe it till they had done so effectually when he had finished speaking the viceroy threw himself back in his chair fatigued with the unwanted exertion he had made and waving his hand signed to us to withdraw with which as may be supposed we were not long in complying the african followed us and being again placed between two soldiers we were conducted to a small low-roofed room which filled up the vacancy between the two principal floors in that body of the building the soldier who had been my accuser did not fail to follow addressing many a triumphant jest upon our situation to the negro the slave affected to laugh at them all heartily but was i believe amusing himself with very different thoughts for the moment we were safely lodged in the room he had chosen he beckoned our good friend the soldier forward and made him untie my hands as he did so an impulse i could scarcely resist almost made me seize him and dash his head against the floor but the negro avenged me more fully for he instantly commanded the other soldiers with a tone of authority they dared not disobey to bind the delinquent with the same cord and taking him down into the court to give him fifty blows of the strapado and farther to keep him in strict confinement till the viceroy's farther pleasure was known ha <laughs> ha cried he to the soldier with a grin that showed every milk-white tooth in his head ha <laughs> ha why do you not laugh now and having placed a guard at our door he left us End of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four. The chamber in which we were now placed was not an unpleasant one, nor was it ill furnished. It had probably been heretofore occupied by some of the inferior officers on duty at the arsenal, and there was still to be seen hanging up above the bed a headpiece and pair of gauntlets of steel and an unloaded musketoon the walls which were entirely destitute of hangings were however ornamented with sundry curious carvings the occupation possibly of many an idle hour representing battles and tournaments and bull-fights wherein neither perspective nor anatomy had been very much consulted and mingled with these rare designs appeared various ciphers and initials together with christian names both male and female in great profusion the windows of the apartment were little better than loopholes with a strong iron bar down the centre they possessed however a view over the whole of the lower part of the city and being situated in the south-western side of the principal corps de logis of the arsenal faced the inner gate communicating with the town and commanded both the inner and outer walls with a part of the counterscarp and glacis on approaching one of these scanty apertures to reconnoitre the objects which surrounded the palace of our detention i heard a party of soldiers conversing under the windows and stopping the babbling of little achilles by a motion of my hand i listened to gain any information that i could considering my present situation as one of the very few in which eavesdropping was not only justifiable but necessary they were merely speaking however of some military movements which had just taken place by order of the viceroy for quelling the insurrection at lerida and they did not at all scruple to censure their commander in their discourse for detaching so great a force from barcelona 
at a moment it might be required to overawe the city this conversation soon ceased and after some coarse vituperation of the catalonians they separated and i heard no more notwithstanding their departure i continued to stand at the window as if i were still listening in order to collect and arrange my own thoughts uninterrupted by the merciless tongue of my attendant who now having recovered his speech of which fright had deprived him for a time seemed resolved to make up by redoubled loquacity for the time he had been obliged to waste in silence i had in truth much to think of the whole circumstances which had lately happened to me as well as my present situation would have afforded sufficient matter for reflection but nevertheless the news which i had heard from the viceroy concerning the chevalier de montenero engaged my thoughts perhaps more than all the rest and made me look upon the chance which brought me to barcelona rather than to any other spanish town and even my detention there as rather fortunate than otherwise notwithstanding all the unpleasant circumstances by which it had been accompanied i doubted not for an instant that however the chevalier might be prepossessed against me in some respects he would instantly do me justice in the matter of the present charge and show the viceroy that it was impossible i could be guilty which none could know better than himself at the same time the knowledge that i had now obtained of his not being spanish by birth freed me at once from the difficulty under which i had before laboured and left me at liberty to exculpate myself from every circumstance which had before appeared suspicious to his eyes without violating my promise to the unfortunate corregidor of saragossa after considering these points for a minute or two i applied myself to calculate how long it would take him to arrive at barcelona supposing that he travelled with all speed from the place where i last saw him and i judged that passing by bagnere and venasque he might have already arrived as i doubted not that when he left lourdes he had directed his course immediately towards spain nothing did i long for more ardently than his coming not alone from the desire of obtaining my liberation but because i longed to re-establish myself in his good opinion i longed to be near one that i esteemed and loved to confide in him all my thoughts my feelings my sorrows my regrets to tell him my own tale to ask for consolation and to seek for advice and certainly never never did i feel so much as at that moment the desolate solitariness of man when with none to aid him he stands in the midst of sorrow and misfortune by himself with all his follies and his weaknesses i will own i had even clung to the society of the little player merely because it was something human that seemed to attach itself to me and while he was near i did not appear so totally abandoned to myself and my evil fate but when i thought of the coming of the chevalier of clearing myself from all suspicions regaining his regard and walking by his counsel my heart was lightened of half its load and i felt as if i had again entered within the magic circle of hope that had long been shut against me while i was thus reflecting the door of the chamber opened and the viceroy's favourite negro slave entered followed by a servant loaded with various kinds of viands and a flask of wine the servant put his burden down on the table and withdrew but the negro remained and shutting the door invited me in a civil tone to partake of the provisions which his excellence had ordered to be brought me my lord the viceroy said he has given me in charge to see that you be hospitably treated and i have pleasure in the task young sir for i hope through your means to rouse my master to a just sense of the oppression which these poor catalonians suffer from the unruly and insolent soldiers there was something in this speech so different from what might be expected in a negro slave and a favourite that i did him the wrong of suspecting that he wished to entrap me into some avowal of opinions contrary to the viceroy's government and i therefore replied you must know more of the subject than i do i have been but three days in catalonia and therefore have had but little opportunity of judging whether the people be oppressed or not even if i had any interest in the matter interest spoke like a white man muttered the black to himself 
ah young sir young sir if you had known oppression as i have you would find an interest in every one you saw oppressed i should have imagined replied i still doubting him though i own most unworthily that your situation was as happy a one as well might be and that your service on his excellence the viceroy was not very oppressive he laid his jet-black finger upon the rich golden bracelet that surrounded his arm think you asked he that that chain because it happens to be gold does not weigh as heavily as if it were of iron it does i tell you frenchman it does true i am slave to the best of masters the noblest of lords true if i were free this moment i would dedicate my life to serve him but still i am a slave still i have been torn from my home and my native land still i have been injured wronged oppressed and every one i see injured every one i see wronged becomes my fellow and my brother but you understand not that i do my good friend more than you think replied i convinced by the earnestness of his manner that what he said was genuine whether you do or not said he there is one principle on which you will understand me you can fancy that i love my benefactor i love him but i also know his faults he is of a soft and idle humour so that his virtues like jewels cast upon a quicksand are lost unknown and swallowed up his idleness is a disease of the body not a defect of the mind though the mind suffers for the fault of the body and so much does he value repose that nothing seems to him of sufficient importance to embitter its sweetness fearless as a lion of death or of danger he is a very coward when opposed to trouble and fatigue he is just honourable and wise but this invincible apathy of nature has brought him to the brink of a precipice over which he would sooner fall than make one strong effort to save himself for two years he has governed catalonia and during those two all the reports of the brute soldiery have been believed few of the complaints of the injured peasants have reached him those few have been through me for the guards and his officers who all join in the pillage of the people take care to cut him off from every other source of information thus the soldiers have heaped wrong upon wrong till the people will bear no more till at lerida at tarragona over half the country in short they are already in revolt barcelona still remains quiet and by the exertion of proper authority by showing the catalonians that the viceroy will do equal justice between them and the soldiery that in future he will be the defender of their rights and liberties the province his government perhaps even his life may be saved for this object when the news reached him last night of the insurrection at lerida and at the same time the charge against you i persuaded him to examine you himself without the presence of his officers or his council you answered wisely and saved yourself when next he shall examine you do more answer nobly and save him and perhaps a whole people tell him the oppression you have seen tell him the murmurs you have heard aid me to stir him up to exertion and you may if it be not too late avert the evils that are gathering round so thickly i will willingly do what you wish replied i but i fear unless he can send one obnoxious regiment after another out of catalonia and supply their place with troops whose discipline is more strict and who have not yet made themselves abhorred by the populace then your viceroy will do but little to allay this fermentation among the people the negro shook his head they will never be changed said he while olivares the count duke governs both spain and the king why did he send them here first he knew them to be the worst disciplined the most cruel turbulent rapacious troops that all spain contained but he wished to punish the catalonians for holding a junta on one of his demands and he sent them these locusts as a scourge however i have your promise before night the count will send for you again he will ask you what rumours you heard how the castilian troops were looked upon by the people and other questions to the same effect conceal nothing let him hear the truth from your lips at least will you do so i will replied i decidedly 
then fare you well said the negro and fall to your meat with the consciousness of doing what is noble and right and thus saying he left the chamber good faith monseigneur said little achilles who had already settled upon the basket of provisions and was making considerable progress through the contents i could not resist this charming sight had you been the king and my master into the bargain i must have fallen too hunger like love levels all conditions you did right my good achilles replied i but hold a moment i must join the party and sitting down with my little attendant i aided him to conclude what he had so happily begun the wine flask succeeded and we neither of us spared it proceeding to the bottom with very equal steps for though as his lord achilles always conceded to me two draughts for his one he found means to compensate for this forbearance by making his draught twice as long as mine indeed when the bottle reached his mouth for the negro had supplied us with no cup the matter became hopeless so long did he point it at the sky during one of these deep draughts which occupied him so entirely that he neither heard nor saw anything else a distant shout reached my ear and then all was silent there was something ominous in the sound for it contained a very different tone from that which bursts from a crowd on any occasion of mirth or rejoicing it was a cry somewhat mingled of horror and hate at least my fancy lent it such a character at the same time i heard the soldiers in the court below running out to the gates as if they had been disturbed by the same sound and went to inquire into its cause little achilles had not heard it so deeply was he engaged in the worship of the purple god and the moment he dismissed the bottle he recommenced his attack upon a fine piece of mountainous mutton which still remained in the basket but in a moment or two his attention was called by a renewal of the shouts and by the various exclamations of the soldiers in the court from which we gathered that most unhappily some new outrage had been offered to the people who encouraged probably by the news of a revolt at lerida had resisted and were even then engaged with the soldiery let them fight it out cried my companion encouraged by the good viands and still better wine of the viceroy let them fight it out by my great namesake's immortal deeds methinks i could push a pike against one of those base soldados myself pray heaven the peasants cut them up into mincemeat but while you look out of the window monseigneur i will lie down and in imitation of that most wise animal an ox will ruminate for some short while after my dinner as he said i had placed myself at the window and while he cast himself on the bed and i believe fell asleep i continued to watch the various streets within the range of my sight to discover if i could the event of the tumult the shouts and cries of which were still to be heard varying in distance and direction as if the crowds from which they proceeded were rapidly changing their place after a moment or two some musket shots were heard mingling with the outcry and then a whole platoon a louder shout than ever succeeded and then again a deep silence in the meanwhile several officers came running at all speeds to the arsenal and in a few minutes two or three small bodies of troops marched out proceeding up a long street of which i had a view almost in its whole length about half way up the soldiers defiled down another street to the right and i lost sight of them the shouts however still continued rising and falling with occasional discharges of musketry but in general the noise seemed to me farther off than it had been at first shortly it began to come rapidly near growing louder and louder and straining my eyes in the direction in which the tumult seemed to lie i beheld a party of the populace driven across the long street i have mentioned by a body of pikemen the catalonians were evidently fighting desperately but the superior skill of the troops prevailed and the undisciplined mob was borne back at the point of the pike notwithstanding an effort to make a stand at the crossing of the streets this first success of the military however did not absolutely infer that their ascendancy would be permanent the tumult was but begun and far from being a momentary effervescence of popular feeling which commencing with a few is only increased by the accession of idlers and vagabonds this was the pouring forth of long suppressed indignation 
the uprising of a whole people to work retribution on the heads of their oppressors and every moment might be expected to bring fresh combatants excited by the thirst of vengeance and animated by the hope of liberty all was now bustle and activity in the arsenal the gates were shut the soldiers under arms the officers called together the walls manned and from the court below the stirring sounds of military preparations rose up to the windows at which i stood telling that the pressing danger of the circumstances had at length roused the viceroy from his idle mood and that he was now taking all the means which a good officer might to put down the insurrection that his negligence had suffered to break out from time to time i caught the calm full tones of his voice giving a number of orders and directions now ordering parties of soldiers to issue forth and support their comrades commanding at the same time that they should advance up the several streets which bore upon the arsenal taking especial care that their retreat was not cut off and that a continual communication should be kept up pointing out to their inferior officers where to establish posts so as to best guard their flanks and avoid the dangers of advancing through the streets of the city where every house might be considered as an enemy's fort and finally directing that in such and such conjectures certain flags should be raised on the steeple of the various churches thus establishing a particular code of signals for the occasion in the meanwhile the tumult in the city increased the firing became more continuous the bells of the churches mingled their clang with the rest and the struggle was evidently growing more and more fierce as fresh combatants poured in on either party at length i saw an officer riding down the opposite street at full speed and dashing into the arsenal the gates of which opened to give him admission he seemed to approach the viceroy whose voice i instantly heard demanding well don ferdinand where are the cavalry why have you not brought up the men-at-arms because it was impossible replied the officer the rebels your excellence have set fire to the stables not a horse would move even after don antonio molina had dispersed the traitors that did it not ten horses have been saved what is to be done my lord return instantly answered the viceroy promptly collect your men-at-arms bid them fight on foot for the honour of castile for the safety of the province for their own lives marshal them in two bodies let one march by the plaza nueva down to the port and the other by the calle de la cruz to the lareda gate i am sorry to say the lareda gate is in the possession of the rebels replied the officer a large body of peasants well armed and mounted attacked it and drove in the soldiers half an hour ago they come from lareda itself as we learn by the shouts of the others the more need to march on it instantly replied the viceroy see the flag is up on the church of the assumption don francisco is there with part of the second tercia divide as i have said send your brother down with one body to the port with the other join don francisco at the church of the assumption take the two brass cannon from the barrier nuevo and march upon the gate of lerida drive back the revels or die the viceroy's orders were given like lightning and turning his horse the officer rode away with equal speed to execute them i marked him as he dashed through the gates of the arsenal and a more soldier-like man i never saw he galloped fast over the drawbridge and through the second gate crossed the open space between the arsenal and the houses of the town and darted up the street by which he had come when suddenly a flash and some smoke broke from the window of a house as he passed i saw him reel in the saddle catch at his horse's mane and fall headlong to the ground while the charger freed from his load ran wildly up the street till he was out of sight the sentinel on the counterscarp had seen the officers fall and instantly passed the news to the viceroy pedro marona cried the count promptly quick mount and bear the same orders to don antonio molina take the calle de la paz quick one way or another we lose our most precious moments don ferdinando should have seen his corslet was better tempered however let half a dozen men be sent out to bring him in perhaps he may not yet be dead the gates of the arsenal were thrown open accordingly and a small party carrying a board to bring home the body issued out but they had scarcely proceeded half-way to the spot where the officer had fallen 
when the sound of the tumult, the firing, the cheers, the cries, the screams, mingled in one terrific roar, rolled nearer and nearer. A single soldier then appeared in full flight in the long street on which my eyes were fixed. Another followed, and another. A shout louder than all the rest rang up to the sky, and rolling and rushing like the billows of a troubled ocean, came pouring down the streets a large body of the Castilian soldiery, urged on by an immense mass of armed peasantry, with whom the first rank of the Castilians was mingled. Though some of the soldiers were still fighting man to man with the Catalonians, the mass were evidently flying as fast as the nature of the circumstances would permit, crushing and pressing over each other and many more must have been trampled to death by the feet of their comrades than fell by the swords of their enemies. In the meanwhile the pursuers, the greater part of whom were on horseback, continued spurring their horses into the disorderly mass of the fugitives, hewing them down on every side, with the most remorseless vengeance, while from the houses on each hand a still more dreadful and less noble sort of warfare was carried on against the flying soldiery scarce a house but one or two of its windows began to flash with musketry raining a tremendous shower of balls upon the head of the unfortunate castilians who jammed up in the small space of a narrow street had no room either to avoid their own fate or avenge their fellows just then however the pursuers received a momentary check from the cannon of the arsenal some of which being placed sufficiently high for the balls to fall amidst the mass of peasantry without taking effect upon the nearer body of the flying soldiers, began to operate as a diversion in favour of the fugitives. The very sound caused several of the horsemen to halt. At that moment my eye fell upon the figure of Garcias, the smuggler, at the head of the peasantry, cheering them on, but by his gestures appearing to tell them that those who would escape the cannonballs must close upon those for whose safety they were fired that now was the moment to make themselves masters of the arsenal and that if they would but follow close they would force their way in with the flying soldiers so animated so vehement was his gesticulation that there hardly needed words to render his wishes comprehensible the panic however though but momentary allowed sufficient time for greater part of the soldiers to throw themselves into the arsenal some indeed being again mingled with the peasantry were shut out and slaughtered to a man the rest prepared to make good the very defensible post they now possessed knowing well that mercy was a word they had themselves blotted out from the language of their enemies in the meanwhile my little companion achilles had evinced much more courage than i had anticipated whether it was that he found or rather fancied greater security in the walls of the arsenal or whether it was that necessity produced the same change in his nature that being in a corner is said to effect upon a cat or whether the quantity of wine which he had drunk had conveyed with itself an equal portion of valour i do not know but certain it is that he lay quite quiet for the greater part of the time without attempting to creep under the bed and only took the precaution of wrapping the bolster around his head to deaden the sound of the cannon once he even rose and approaching the other window stood upon tiptoes to take a momentary glance at what was proceeding without the scene he beheld however was no way encouraging and he instantly retreated to the bed and settled himself once more comfortably amongst the clothes after having drained the last few drops of wine that remained in the flask it may easily be supposed that the viceroy was not particularly anxious to spare the houses of a town which had shown itself so generally inimical, and, consequently, every cannon which could be brought to bear upon the point where the insurgents were principally collected was kept in constant activity, and the dreadful havoc which they made began to be evident both amongst the insurgents and upon the houses round about. Garcias, however, who was now evidently acting as commander-in-chief of the populace, was prompt to remedy all the difficulties of his situation, and animating and encouraging the peasantry by his voice, his gestures, and his example, he kept alive the spirit which had hitherto carried them on such great deeds. It is not to be imagined that any regular fascines should have been prepared by the peasantry for the assault of the arsenal. 
but they had with them six small pieces of cannon which they had taken and which they hastily brought against the gate the murderous fire however both of cannon and musketry kept up upon the only point where they could have any effect would have prevented the possibility of working them had not the fire of the arsenal itself by demolishing the wall of one of the houses opposite discovered the inside of a wool warehouse for scenes were no longer wanting the immense wool packs were instantly brought forward and arranged by the orders of garcias into as complete a traverse as could have been desired supported from behind by the stones of the street which the insurgents threw up with pickaxes and spades their position now being much more secure a movement took place amongst the people and while garcias with a considerable body continued to ply the principal gate with his battery two large masses of the insurgents moved off on either hand and presently after reappeared at the entrance of the various streets which surrounded the arsenal rolling before them their wool packs which put them in comparative security it was evident that a general attack was soon to be expected and exerting himself with an activity of which i had not thought him capable the viceroy put himself forward in every situation of danger from time to time i caught a glimpse of his figure toiling commanding assisting and slackening not in his activity though the marks of excessive fatigue were sufficiently evident in his countenance of course the gate could not long resist the continued fire of the insurgents battery and as soon as it gave way upon some signal which i did not perceive the whole mass of the peasantry poured forth from every street and advancing steadily upon the most tremendous fire from the guns of the arsenal ran up the glacis and easily effected a lodgment in the counterscarp with the wool packs the moment was one of excessive interest and i was gazing from the window marking with anxiety every turn of a scene that possessed all the sublime of horror and danger and excited passion when i heard a step behind me and a cry from my little friend achilles which instantly made me turn my head i had but time to see the spanish soldier who had accused me to the viceroy with his broadsword raised over my head and to spring aside when the blow fell with such force as to dash a piece out of the solid masonry of the window frame by the eyes of saint geronimo cried the man thou shalt not escape me though i die this day thou shalt go half an hour before me and darting forward he raised his weapon to aim another blow at my head unarmed as i was my only chance was to rush in upon him and getting within his guard render the struggle one of mere personal strength and making a feint as if i would leap aside again i took advantage of a movement of his hand and cast myself into his chest with my full force he gave way sooner than i expected and we both went down but somehow though in general a good wrestler certainly infinitely stronger than my adversary and though at first also i was uppermost i soon lost my advantage i believe it was that in attempting to place my knee on his breast it slipped from off his corslet flinging me forwards so that my balance being lost he easily cast me off and set his own knee upon me his sword he had let fall but he drew his long poniard and threw back his arm to plunge it into my bosom when suddenly he received a tremendous blow on the side of the head which dashed him prostrate on the floor and to my surprise and astonishment i saw little achilles in the person of my deliverer my pressing danger had communicated to his bosom a spark of generous courage which he had never before felt and seizing the unloaded musketoon he had come up behind my adversary and dealt him the blow which had proved my salvation nor did he stop there for what with joy and excitement at his success and fear that our enemy should recover from his stupefaction which the blow had caused he continued to belabour his head and face with strokes of the musketoon with a silent vehemence and rapidity which not all my remonstrances could stop even after the man was evidently dead he continued to reiterate blow upon blow sometimes pausing and looking at him with eyes in which horror and fear and excitement were all visible and then adding another and another stroke as i have often seen a dog after he has killed a rat or any other noisome animal 
every now and then start back and look at him and then give it another bite and another till he has left it scarce a vestige of its original form seizing his arm however during one of these pauses i begged him to cease and would have fain called his attention by thanking him for his timely aid but the little man could not yet overcome the idea that his enemy might still get up and take vengeance on him for the unheard-of daring which he had exercised let him kill me monseigneur let him kill me cried he don't you see he moves look look and with straining eyes he struggled forward to make quite sure that his victory wanted nothing of completion by adding another blow to those he had already given he will never move again achilles replied i spare your blows for you bestow them on a dead man as well as he merited his fate had we not better tie his hands at least cried the little player he lies still enough too only think of my having killed a man i shall be a brave man for the rest of my life but if i had not killed him you would have been lying there as still as he is i expressed my gratitude as fully as i could but objected to the proposal of tying a dead man's hands no doubt indeed could remain of his being no longer in a state to endanger any one for having no helmet on at the time he entered the very first blow of the musketoon must have nearly stunned him and several of the after ones had driven in his skull in various places it is probable that having been kept in confinement by the order of the viceroy he had been liberated at the moment the danger became pressing and that instead of presenting himself where he might do his duty his first care had been to seek the means of gratifying his revenge no doubt attributing to me the punishment he had received such an event as my death in the confusion and danger of the circumstances he most probably imagined would pass unnoticed and no one at all events could prove that it had been committed by his hands whether his comrade who had been placed as sentinel at the door where we were confined had been removed for the more active defence of the place or whether he had connived at the entrance of the assassin i know not but at all events if he was there he must have been an accomplice and consequently would not have betrayed his fellow such however was a strange fate for a daring and ferocious man to fall by the hands of one of the meekest cowards that ever crept quietly through existence and yet i have often remarked that bad actions the most boldly undertaken and the best designs often nay most frequently fall back upon the head of their projectors repelled from their intended course by something petty unexpected or despised End of chapter twenty four